Hi everyone, Dr. Mike here. Today I'm going to start a very first lecture on a series of lectures looking at gut microbiota and its involvement in health. So this means we're going to talk about, today at least, an introduction to what the gut microbiota actually is and a very brief overlook on what type of bacteria are present and where it's present. And then in the future lectures, we're going to have a look at its implications in certain disease states. Now these disease states may be inflammatory bowel diseases, they could be cancers, could be other inflammatory based diseases, neurological based diseases, including neurodegenerative, uh, neuroimmune as well, but also looking at what role probiotics and prebiotics may also play in benefiting our health, if at all. So let's get started in this lecture and have a look at what the gut microbiome actually is. So there's two different words. There's microbiota and microbiome. So the microbiota is the actual microorganisms that live on and within us. The microbiome, well that has to do with the genetic products that these living organisms produce. So microbiota, the living organisms themselves, the microbiome, the genetic output or genetic products of these microorganisms. Now if I were to take you and I were to separate out all the human cells from the bacterial cells on your body, what you'd find is for every one of your cells, there'd be around about one to two bacterial cells. And if I were to weigh up the, all those bacterial cells, that equal around about one to 1.5 kilograms. So you are basically a system that allows for the survival and movement of these bacterial cells. The question then is where do we get these bacterial cells from? So we need to start at the beginning and the beginning of you. So when it comes to you moving through that vaginal canal of your mum at birth, you are exposed and colonized by trillions of bacteria. Now your question may be, well, I was born by cesarean section. And what that means is you weren't exposed to the same type of microbiota that somebody who was born vaginally was. Now, that's not necessarily a big issue because what you'll find is if you compare children who were born vaginally compared to C-sections, after around about three to six months, their gut microbiome is basically indistinguishable. Now, where else can you get this uh, microbiota from? Well, as a child, apart from vaginal delivery, also get it through the breast milk too. And your question may also be, well, what if I was formula fed? Well, again, there's gonna be some differences in that early stage from three to six months in what gut microbiota actually colonizes you. But again, after three to six months becomes indistinguishable. However, there are some studies that state that these early differences may lead to some sort of uh, effects later on in life. Now these effects are tentative, but they do suggest that they may be associated with some immune issues and potentially obesity and diabetes based issues. But again, they're quite tentative at the moment. All right, so what type of bacteria are we getting and where does this bacteria actually go? Because we know that it doesn't just go into our gut. Now when I say gut, I'm talking about our small and large intestines, but we know that we've got microbiota all over our body. And it's not just microbes in the sense of bacteria. It's also archaea, it's also viruses, it's also fungi, which are other domains in the hierarchy of life, all right? So you've got bacteria, archaea, viruses, and fungi living on and within you. Now, where do they sit? Well, we know we've got huge amounts on our skin, in our nasal cavity, oral cavity, esophagus, stomach, small intestines, large intestines, also various aspects of our respiratory tract, genitourinary tract as well. So basically every part of your body you can think of is going to have some form of microbe or microbiota associated with it. What part has the most, so what anatomical position or location has the most amount of microbiota? Well, significantly it's going to be the gut and that's going to be the small and large intestines. If we were to actually have a look at this diagram that I've drawn here, now this isn't an anatomically correct diagram of the gastrointestinal tract, but it's more of a functional diagram. So it has the lowest part of the esophagus, it's got the stomach, it's got the small intestines. Now the small intestines is broken up into three parts. The first part, which is called the duodenum, the next part, which is called the jejunum, and then the last part, which is called the ileum. Then you have the colon. So the reason why I've drawn it up like this is because you actually have different proportions of bacteria and the composition of bacteria is actually quite different in each of these particular parts. So for example, if we were to look just at the stomach, 
and you were to count the amount of bacterial cells in the stomach, you'd find that it's going to be around about 10 to 100 cells per gram in the stomach. That's not actually a huge amount of bacterial cells. As we move from the stomach through that pyloric sphincter into the duodenum, what you're going to find is there's some more. You're going to find that there's going to be around about a thousand cells per gram. Now, I may be off by an order, uh, an, uh, a order of magnitude, so times 10, but in actual fact, that's not necessarily too bad. So 100 cells per gram on average for the stomach, 1,000 cells per gram on average for the duodenum. You're gonna find for the jejunum, it's gonna be around about 10,000 cells per gram. When we look at the ileum, it's gonna be around about 100 cells, 100,000 cells per gram. But then when we get to the colon, for example, you're gonna find that per gram, there's going to be around about 1000000000 what's that? That's a million, billion, trillion cells per gram. So the colon has the highest abundance of bacteria living within it, okay? Now you do have bacteria in all these other places, but again, the highest abundance within the colon. What does that mean in regards to the function of this area compared to the other area? Well, if we look at the stomach, for example, the stomach plays a number of different roles. It's a, it's a site of storage for foodstuffs, but it's also a site for what we call chemical and mechanical digestion. So the stomach has three layers of muscle that can fold in upon itself and that mechanically digest foodstuffs. But we also know that the stomach has certain type of cells called parietal cells that produce hydrochloric acid and also other types of cells that can produce enzymes like molecular scissors that can break up proteins. And as we move to the duodenum, well the duodenum is the first part of the small intestines that receives a whole bunch of what's called pancreatic juices. The pancreas will squirt in enzymes that break down proteins, fats, and carbohydrates into the duodenum, but there's also a whole bunch of mucus and bicarbonate and bile that gets into this area as well. So the duodenum is a lot of stuff actually happening. As we move through the uh, jejunum and ileum, this is the primary site for nutrient absorption. So that's why in the duodenum, we break down all the nutrients with our uh, molecular scissors or the scissors that break down fats, proteins and carbohydrates. Okay, So amylase breaks is the enzyme that breaks down carbs, lipases break down fats, proteases break down proteins and hopefully they're broken up significantly enough that they can be absorbed here at the jejunum and ileum. Now once we get to the colon itself, this is going to be the primary site for water absorption, but also because there's such a large amount of bacteria, the bacteria themselves are going to produce metabolic products for us to absorb and for us to use. Now, what type of products? Well, they actually help us absorb, produce and absorb vitamins and minerals for us to utilize. Examples of this include vitamin K and also B12. Very important for our survival. But this microbiota that's living in the colon also produce some other metabolites. Now the most abundant metabolites is something called short chain fatty acids, okay? Short chain fatty acids include acetate, um, propionate, and butyrate. So these are the three most common short chain fatty acids. So the majority of products that these bacteria produce in our colon are these three types of short chain fatty acids. When I say short chain fatty acids, I mean they have between one to six carbons within their chain. And what do these short chain fatty acids do? Like I said, acetate, propionate, butyrate. Well, they play roles in helping regulate inflammation, helping uh, absorption and digestion, um, and also tend to play a number of different roles if there's some sort of dysregulation for the propensity of diabetes, obesity, neurodegenerative diseases, cancers, inflammatory diseases, many different roles, okay? So what I've also drawn up over here as well, so I wanna to talk to you about the type of bacteria that's living within our gut now. So now we're focusing on the gut, which is again, the focus of today's lecture. There are around about, so we know that there's about 50 known phyla of bacteria on this earth. So when I say phyla, I'm referring to that taxonomical hierarchy of organisms. So remember, you've got life, domain, kingdom, phyla, 
and then you've got all the other subcategories going down to genus and species, right? So phyla of bacteria, well, there's 59 types on the planet. However, human beings have within them, in their gut, around about 10-ish. And what you'll find is on average, you or I probably only have around about six to seven main types of bacterial phyla that live within us. Now, what are those six main types? Well, these main types are actinobacteria, Firmicutes, Proteobacteria, Bacteroidetes, Cyanobacteria, Fusobacteria, and less common, Viricomicrobia. Okay, these are the main types of phyla. So you're probably looking at them going, I've never heard of any of these before, but you'll find that the certain subcategories or species of these, such as Streptomyces, Lactobacillus, Mycoplasma, these are all subcategories of these, or species, of these particular phyla. So even though there's only six, on average, six to seven to 10 phyla that live within our gut, there's around about 160 species that you or I would have within our gut that fit within these particular categories. Now in total, what you'll find is that human beings, we've identified around about a thousand species that live within us, but on average, each of us have about 160 of these a thousand species. So what does that mean sitting back and listening to this? Well, one, we've actually got a very few amount of phyla compared to the 50 odd phyla, we only have about six living within our gut. However, of these six, we have around about 160 different species. Now, what you'll find is if I were to take you and screen all these species of bacteria within your gut, and I would take myself and screen the species of bacteria in my gut and compare them, they would be highly variable. Your gut bacteria would be quite different to my gut bacteria. However, if we were to have a look at the function, so what function are each of these bacterial strains playing within your body compared to mine, there's gonna be significant overlap, meaning that the function of your bacteria is gonna be pretty much the same as the function of my gut bacteria. So what that means is there's a lot of redundancy in the system. You can lose particular strains and potentially there's other strains to make up or take over that particular role. But what that also means is something very important when it comes to the clinical implications of gut bacteria is that a lot of people tend to focus on the strain and the species of the bacteria for health when people should probably be focusing on the functional outcome of the bacteria. So people shouldn't focus necessarily on the strain or the species, but on the function. What do they do? Is it involved in digestion? Is it involved in metabolism? Is it involved in inflammation? That's what we sh should probably be focusing our attention on. So like I said, these are the six main types. Now, the other thing that makes this even more complex is that depending on where you look on the body, the composition changes. So for example, if we were to look at skin, the most common type of the bacteria is actino, bacteria present on the skin, then the Firmicutes. If we were to have a look at the oral cavity, the two most common types are the Firmicutes and the Proteobacteria. Now, this is a really interesting point. I've drawn up two diagrams for the stomach. I've drawn one that's positive for H. pylori, which is Helicobacter pylori, which is a strain of bacteria, a species, and the stomach, which is negative for Helicobacter pylori. All right, firstly, what is Helicobacter pylori? Helicobacter pylori is a species of bacteria that basically uh, has infected more than 50% of the population, lives within our gut, and what it does is something very specific and uh, very nasty sometimes. Now, a lot of us are gonna be asymptomatic for the infestation of Helicobacter pylori, but what you'll find is that for a subset of individuals, what this H. pylori does is one, it reduces the amount of mucus that our stomach wall has, right? Reduces the amount of mucus that our stomach wall produces, okay? Two, increases the amount of acid that the stomach wall produces. Now what you'll find is there's something called gastric or peptic ulcers. Peptic ulcers are usually produced when there's an imbalance of these two things. If there's an imbalance of the mucus that lines the stomach compared to the amount of acid that's produced by the lining of the stomach. So usually our stomach wall has certain cells called parietal cells that produce hydrochloric acid. Now hydrochloric acid has a pH of around about 
one to three. Now this is enough to be able to digest nails and razor blades and things like that. That's how low that pH is, quite acidic. And it produces this and pushes it into what's called the lumen or the hollow inside of the stomach so that when proteins are ingested, proteins are these three dimensional folded structures. So when these proteins touch this low pH, they unfold. Now if proteins unfold called denaturation, it's a lot easier for the molecular scissors or the enzymes that can break proteins down to chop it up. So if you first come in with a protein that's all folded up like that, very difficult to chop up. But once it's pH one to three and it unfolds, well it's very easy to get the molecular scissors to chop it up. Now, your question may be how come the acid that the stomach produces doesn't digest itself? And the answer is because of this mucus that the stomach wall also produces. It's very thick, very viscous, and also has not an acidic pH, but a basic pH, and helps create this buffering capacity so the acid doesn't digest the cell wall itself. However, when you have an infiltration of Helicobacter pylori, so you're positive for it, it infiltrates this wall, reduces the mucus lining, increases the acid, and the acid can start to digest the wall of the, of the stomach. Now, if you digest the wall of the stomach, it starts to produce an ulcer. And these ulcers can go through the many different layers of the stomach. So if it starts to move its way through the mucus lining and the muscular layer and so forth, it can bleed all the way through into the sterile environment just outside of the stomach. And that can be very dangerous. The interesting thing is that H. pylori has been not just a causative agent for uh, gastric peptic ulcers, also a causative agent for certain types of adenocarcinomas in the stomach as well, so certain types of cancers, and also something called malt tumors, all right? So these are, these are tumors, of, tumors of the lymphoid tissue, which lymphoid tissue are sort of like the tonsils of the stomach as well. The other interesting point is this, of individuals that have H. pylori in the stomach, you'll find that, that H. pylori sits within the proteobacteria phyla, all right? It sits within the proteobacteria phyla, and you'll find that it starts to infiltrate the stomach, and the majority of bacteria in the stomach, if you're H. pylori positive, is proteobacteria. It doesn't necessarily have to just be H. pylori, but other proteobacteria. So what that means is, when you have an infection of H. pylori, you have a low diversity of gut bacteria or stomach bacteria. Compare this to people who are negative for H. pylori and you'll find that it's quite diverse. The majority of bacteria is going to be the actinobacteria, then it's going to be the firmicutes, then it's going to be proteobacteria and bacteroidetes. This is a diverse stomach flora or diverse stomach microbiota. What I want to highlight here is that when you look at diversity versus non-diverse or uh, um, certain parts of the body that don't have large varieties of gut microbiota, as we move through, if you find that the, the, that the diversity is reduced, this results in an increased likelihood for many different disease states. Now, these disease states can include obesity, diabetes, cancer, certain neurodegenerative diseases, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease, and neuroinflammatory diseases such as multiple sclerosis. These have been associated, not necessarily causative, but have been associated with these particular diseases. So a reduced gut diversity of microbiota has been associated with these particular disease states. Okay, that's very important. Especially the obesity, you'll find that those who have a very low diversity, uh, more increased li greater increased likelihood of becoming obese. As we move through to the colon, so this is another important point, and you should probably remember this as we move through this lecture series, is that there are two, two of the most common type phyla or bacteria present within the colon, and remember the colon has the most, around about a trillion cells per gram in the colon. Two most common types are the Firmicutes and the Bacteroidetes. The Firmicutes and the Bacteroidetes are the two most, they're basically the only two types that you focus on. However, when you look at the ratio between these two, people are variable. And it's not always a one-to-one -one ratio, sometimes the ratio is off. And a change in this ratio has also been associated with particular diseased and inflammatory states as well. 
In addition to that, what we're also gonna talk about is that there is a theory out there in the research that states that the proteobacteria are the bad guys. Now you should never, when it comes to biology, none of these guys are all be it good, none of these guys are all be it bad, all right? Doesn't work like that in biology. Now you're gonna have pathogenic or non-pathogenic, pathogenic, disease-causing, non-pathogenic, not disease-causing. However, you can find that some, it doesn't matter which one, even the Firmicutes, there's gonna be certain species that can irritate us and potentially be disease-causing, all right? But there's a theory out there that states that when you have, so you've got the balance of microbiota, when you've got an unbalance called dysbiota, if that dysbiotic um, imbalance is shifted with an abundance of proteobacteria, that has been associated with increased risk of disease states. And this increased risk of disease states include those of the inflammatory bowel diseases, um, cancers, um, and so forth, so a wide variety. Um, so that's basically the brief introduction when it comes to gut microbiota. Like I said, in the future videos, we're gonna have a look at its role in health, inflammation, uh, certain disease states, focusing on the brain-gut axis, looking at gut inflammatory diseases and cancers as well, and looking at what the current evidence states for probiotics and prebiotics and whether they're useful or not. Thanks everyone.